join internationally acclaimed overland expert Paul Marsh and award-winning journalist Gregory Simpson as they delve into all things responsible overlanding. From choosing the right vehicle, getting yourself prepared, getting your vehicle prepared, safety tips and much, much more. Only on Responsible Overlanding. Zach Khan says, great videos, Paul. Uh, please share your advice on, on the journey of shipping a vehicle to Pakistan. I'm planning a trip to take my own vehicle to Pakistan. So any tips and advice would be great. Thank you. From where is he leaving? Uh, Zach Khan, he doesn't say where he's leaving, but he's, his destination is Pakistan. Okay. Well, I've driven through Pakistan um, many years ago. And we drove across from London to Sydney. I, I need more information. Well, then, well, then, I I'm, think, a more broad question: shipping to different you know, countries. Uh, uh, you know, shipping is actually what, very what, shipping is very easy, and I think you know whenever you're shipping a vehicle, the important part is to find a very reliable uh, shipping line. And each so you get the shipping line that actually you know uh, floats on the water, owns the ships, and then you get agents either side that yes. clear. Okay, and that's the important yes. part. Really you're clearing well. agents. So, you know, you, you're going to need a certain amount of documentation when you ship. So you're going to, depending on where the car is going. If I'm shipping a car from South Africa, it's registered in South Africa. To take it out of South Africa, I need to get a carnet, to passage, which is a document that allows the vehicle to move. And I'm not exporting the vehicle. So it's going to go for a period of time on this carnet, which is allocated for normally a year. That length, long. So it's like a car visa. It's like a car passport. Okay, and uh, that allows you to take the vehicle out without, I'm not exporting it, mm. I'm taking it out for a period of time to bring it back to the country of origin. And if that car now expires, you can renew it if you're still traveling for more than a year. And you'll need your registration documents and obviously passports and copies of all that. Now, you get a very good clearing agent and what they will do is they will actually run the whole process. You'll bring your vehicle to the, to the port or to their warehouse and they will actually then take the whole process. It's always a good idea to prepare your car properly for shipping. And when I say prepare your car properly, no food. They will want you to have the fuel tanks almost empty. Okay? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's so that you can ship it as non-hazardous. And you'll have to be able to disconnect the batteries which is a good thing. So if you've got auxiliary batteries, I always say to people, charge them up fully, you disconnect them, put something on there. And if you've got the main battery, um, leave a spanner in the car that actually, you know, they can undo your battery and they can disconnect it. Because the worst thing that happens is what they do is they, they put your vehicle into a container. And I always advise people, be there when they put your vehicle in the container. See exactly how they load it into the container. See how it's strapped down. So when a vehicle is put in a container, it's driven into the container, you normally leave the keys with it, okay? I normally put the tire pressures a bit harder, because if it's going to be on the water for a good length of time, it's good to put the tire pressures a bit harder, making sure that the vehicle can go into the container. So if you've got a, a height restriction, make sure you understand the height of your vehicle and the, the, the height of the container, because you get containers in two heights, standard height and a high capacity. It's more expensive to use a high capacity. but. It's a lot less hassle than taking your whole tent and roof rack off and storing it next to your car. So um, ideally, the, the vehicle goes in the container, and then what they'll do is they'll chock the wheels with wood. They'll take big blocks of wood and they'll nail it in behind the tire, behind each tire, and I like them to do it in front of each tire as well, because it's a heavy vehicle. Before I take the vehicle to the, to the shipping lines, I also like to prepare the car so that I can reduce the amount of surface rust. Is it strapped rust. down to the bottom of the, of the... It gets strapped down. So once yeah. it's blocked in, so let's go through the process, it gets driven in, it gets blocks knocked into the floor, the container's a wooden floor, and then knock it in with nails through the wood in front and behind your vehicle. That's just to stop it moving, okay? And then it gets strapped. Uh, normally, normally it gets strapped through the wheels or some, and, and through the wheels and onto the sides of the container and then I also like them to take from the bumpers and strap it down. So I make sure that I'm happy to pay for more straps. Mm. I need to make sure the guys properly strap the vehicle. And, and so how many points would you have? So eight points of Well, four, four the, the wheels. Yeah. They'll strap the wheels down, yeah. okay, and they'll often take it. And rear bump, front bump. You, you need to do, yeah. I do that for my yeah. vehicle, I, I do that because the vehicle, if they strap the, the wheels or the axles down, you've got to be careful straps don't go over the brake lines, 
Yeah. That's important. And they don't, any strap is not going to rub or damage anything on, on the vehicle. So, you know, if they're strapping the wheels down, or sometimes they take it through the rims. People have different ways of strapping it down. The important part is the axles can't move. What can move, though, is the body can still move on the yeah. springs. Okay? So by putting the four corners, yeah. the bumpers down, you're just reducing that amount of exactly. movement there. And that's all you're trying to do. And then the battery needs to be disconnected so that no power can be drained out of it. Uh, and then what they'll do is they will then seal the containers with a with a, a seal which has got a number on it and you'll photograph that. So I take photographs of when it's all in, when it's strapped down, I photograph it, doors closed, container number and container code. And I keep, and they normally, a good, good shipping line will always do that for you. And then you've got to take insurance. So if anything happens to your vehicle, uh, you need to provide them with an inventory of what you need and, and take a photographic inventory as well. And remember that, you know, on the other side, when it arrives, you ideally need to be there to take it out the container. Exactly. Otherwise, it gets taken out, put in a warehouse, and that's when you can start yeah. losing stuff yeah. because you're not in control of your vehicle. Exactly. So there is quite a lot to shipping your vehicle. Uh, it's very simple. The key is to make sure that you get a very good clearing agent where you start from where you're sending it to and where it's being received. Make sure that the documents that you're sending with the vehicle are, are sent by the one clearing agent to the other clearing agent. Because it doesn't help when your vehicle arrives and your documents are still in transit because yeah. the guy forgot to send them. A good clearing agents are on top of this. Absolutely. And that's why it's, it's gold dust to have good clearing agents uh, who will help you through this process. Nice. Your vehicle's like your home, okay? And you're going, to, you're going to personalize your home. And by personalizing your home, you're going to put little creature comforts. You're going to find spaces for things that you all like. So, and that's where, you know, when it's a couple, it's, it's so important that you both decide on where you're putting stuff. And, and you're, trust me, your wife's going to have things that she knows are important. So in our glove box, we've got a mini first aid kit. And in there, Joe will have stuff in there that... Maybe it's something for my lips, or maybe it's something for a headache, or maybe it's something, you know, just small, and it's, it's right there. Painkiller. You know? And she knows that that's really convenient, yeah. and we'll just have that there. So it's, it's, it's the teamwork of building up your vehicle, but understanding what are your needs and where is it going to go, and make sure it has the same place. It takes a few trips to build that up. So pockets that we put on the vehicles made out of canvas or whatever are really there to give you access to something conveniently that you can reach there, grab it, and put it back there until you decide to move it to another place. But don't be the one who moves it or puts it somewhere else and the next time your wife or you are looking for it, <laughs> it won't be popular. Put it back in the same space. Yeah. And then tons again, thanks for the opportunity. I have a 2009 Prada 4 litre V6 with 450,000 Ks on, wow. on, the, on the clock. Never given a day's travel. I've uh, replaced wear and tear. Um, what would you, I'd like to ask your opinion on uh, in building this vehicle up for sub-Saharan Africa. Aside from the obvious, obvious lack of fuel efficiency, um, uh, what sort of things should you be looking at for trying to deck out a Prada so, 4 liter? You know, even even the we spoke about the 100 series earlier. You know, it's independent front suspension. The Prada is similar well, sort of scenario, similar to setup. So your your biggest challenge is one of the weaknesses is steering rack. You know, so on the live axles you've got a steering box. It's much stronger. It's more robust. The one weakness on the Prados is the steering rack. The 100 series Land Cruiser as well. Your steering rack is takes very good engine. Now that 4 liter V6 isn't it? It's bomb proof. Yeah. It really is bomb proof. And and I absolutely agree with you. You know things like on that motor, you can measure compressions. You if the car if the motor's running sweetly, it's not using oil, and it's you know keep driving. You know, exactly. But you need to you need to change to things. You know you need to look at things like auxiliaries. What's the alternator like? What's the starter like? What's the has, where's the water pump being changed? You know, yeah. and look at components that can wear out on that on that motor. And then look at things like hoses. You know, people forget that those hoses for the heater have been there probably since new. Yeah, and they tired. You know, and, and if a hose bursts, your motor's gone. Yeah. And and the old radiators. <coughs> so yeah, again, and so sorry. When you're going through any vehicle like that to build it up. Understand the weak points of the car and make sure you address those. So on those Prados, ball joints, upper and lower ball joints, absolutely genuine Toyota, put new parts in, build them back up. <coughs> Wheel bearings would be another thing I would be looking at doing and saying, you know what, they've done their mileage. So how much more life do you want out of that component 
So this is where it comes into preventative maintenance. So instead of spending the money on buying a new car, throw a bit of money into the old yeah. one and give it another And I think that's years. a balance. Okay, so that's always a balance because sometimes you can put a lot of money into an old car and you're pouring good money after bad, the old adage goes. But in a four-wheel drive, if you've got a good solid body, a good solid chassis and the interior and all looks good, you're weighing up. What's it going to cost me to build and sort this, this vehicle out? Now, if he had a problem with his engine, he could pick up another second-hand engine for not a lot of money yeah. and put it in. Beautiful. So, so you know, I would be looking and, at... And he said he's getting 13.5 litres per 100, which is not bad. Yeah. Look, <laughs> any, any fuel consumption depends on how you drive. I suppose it. That, that's, <laughs> that's going on a slippery mine shot. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure. He's probably, doing, he's probably driving very carefully, but that's yeah. a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small indicator of the fact that he definitely, I'm sure, looks after that yeah. vehicle, especially to get that sort of mileage on it. And credit to you, looking after the truck like that, they are fantastically capable so vehicles. So you could get to a million K on that, theoretically. You know, it's, cars get that mileage if you look after them. Things do wear out. What you're trying to do when you're looking at an old car with high mileage is trying to look and say, what has had really severe use and what's going to let me down that I need to change? Absolutely. And Chris saw another one, great videos. Interesting question here. He, he, he saw that you were designing a trippy for four people. He'd like to know a little bit more about how you'd, how you'd get your head around that. Okay, so generally the, troopies the family with the two foot small kids. Small children, absolutely. So we're still busy with that design and it's actually, I'm quite excited to continue with lockdown. Our projects, that particular project is still undergoing. Um, so it's going to be, have Comfortable, safe seats for the two two little ones to sit on. Okay, so you've got the driver's seat, passenger seat, and then behind that another set of seats. Obviously, getting aftermarket seats. Yeah, they'll be after. Well, we'll look and see what we can find. You know, we need if we can put two good Toyota seats in there. We want to create space between those seats. One that you can you can utilize that space and also storage underneath the seats, because what you've got is you've got very. You now by putting two seats, you're taking up quite a lot of valuable storage space. And now you've got a couple who want to travel and they're looking at taking their children. So the children need some space. So maybe the, each child could have their own space under the seat that they can put their own personal toys, whatever they need. And then also when children are traveling, you need to be able to have some sort of entertainment for them. So what's quite nice is to build something that can, maybe a little table that can fall down or something that, that allows them to be able to watch something, do something, draw a little picture whatever. Yeah. So it's, it's important to create their space and make That is another space. key consideration is your children when you're traveling. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> and when they're smaller children, you know, you've got that. So uh, again, you know, they've got a um, the pop-up roof on that vehicle. They're going to have the... Uh, I see you've got, you've got two different pop-up roofs. One where the, it actually goes up on both sides. So that's not available in South Africa. That looks that's like actually, a really good roof. Uh, it was... Look, I think it served its purpose. It was built in New, in New Zealand. Yeah. It's called a Kia, Kia conversion. Um, it's, it gives a lot of space in the vehicle. Um, they're not made. I don't know if they even make them anymore. And, and the concept of that roof going straight up mm. is great for giving space. It's right. almost like a Westie or Westphalia. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think the, you know, the option of the other ones that are designed with a the wedge shape where the, yeah. the roof actually pivots up like yeah. that. And that certainly gives us a lot more you know, convenience to build the vehicles and enough space inside. But yeah. it makes it easy to pull the bed down inside, someone can sleep up top. So with, with going back to this vehicle with a four two with a four children, two children and two adults. So the adults will sleep upstairs, the kids will sleep downstairs. So behind those seats we're going to have storage designed that they can access. Up, what parents on the roof and the kids on the kids, floor? Kids not on the floor. So basically behind the rear seats. So you've got front seat, passenger front, front two seats, the second row of seats. Yeah. Okay. And we're looking to see how we're going to build that into a bed area for the children. So it might be that, that the seats fold forward and we can create a bed area for the children. I haven't actually and designed And storage, where you're going to put the, the storage? Where Behind those back. seats, we've got storage and you're going to have to put, you know, we've got a fridge and a kitchen. Are we building it? Okay. So it's not going to be as much movable space inside the vehicle, but it's going to give a very safe safe spot for for the parents with their children mm. to be because they're small children exactly you know that's probably the best place you know, to be well it is because they're in the vehicle yeah. mom and dad have got space yeah. so everyone can sleep comfortably yeah. and if you're in the car you're safe you're comfortable yeah. 
And, um, and then they're still relatively close to their parents, they're not going to get scared. Just, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, it's going to be a good build. We'll, we will we'll feature it. It'll be interesting. Perfect.